Thank you, Dr. Dresner, for joining us on Heart Talk at Summit 2023. Uh, really excited that you are here with us today. I know that you've been speaking, and so I really want to hear about those presentations. But first, can you share a little bit about your background? You are specifically interested in um, youth sports and cardiology. Can you share a little bit about your background and uh, how you came into your current profession? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first, thanks for having me on this. This is exciting for me as well. It's been wonderful to be at the Cardiac Arrest you know, Survival Summit. Yes. Incredible people that are here. Um, I am a family medicine and sports medicine physician. I, I work mostly in the space of sports cardiology. Um, I direct our Center for Sports Cardiology at the University of Washington. Okay. It's a nice collaboration between sports medicine and cardiology. Our singular mission is to prevent sudden cardiac arrest and death in young persons um, during sports. And this conference and this opportunity here is a chance to network with a lot of people in the same space who are working towards preventing sudden death and, and preventing or treating sudden cardiac arrest. So, you know, how did I get into the sports cardiology space? Right, right. I knew I wanted to go to med school. I, I quickly fell in love with like everything about medicine. Okay. I played basketball competitively when I was young. I played basketball at Brown University. When I was in college, um, was the same time that Hank Gathers had his sudden cardiac death, which was very in public view. And following that, other cases like Len Bias and, and others. And so suddenly your framework for exercise leads to healthy life and right. uh, should be good for you, suddenly you're seeing mm -hmm. the healthiest appearing athletes right. can right. have sudden cardiac mm -hmm. arrest. And made me think about it. In medical school, got exposed to an incredible rotation at UCLA on, in, on sports medicine, a lecture on athlete's heart, sudden cardiac death, and I just fell in love with the topic. And eventually in, in residency fellowship did my initial sort of research and academic work in that. And since then have just been fortunate that I found an area I'm passionate about. Okay, so you presented two separate sessions. Mm -hmm. Can you share a little bit about those sessions and also why? Yeah, so the, so the first session that I presented at was the opening session, mm -hmm. which was a really unique opportunity. It presented after Jeff Miller, who's yeah. uh, vice president for the NFL. And Jeff gave a, a heartfelt and also personal remembrance of sort of the experience of what he went through and then what the NFL has done subsequently to the DeMar Hamlin incident. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, I followed that with a little bit about the, of the science around sudden cardiac arrest and survival, so reflecting over the last two decades. And it really is interesting to reflect how much progress we've made in the last two decades when we think about outcomes from cardiac arrest, especially in our young athletes. So dating back from 2000 to 2006, where average survival in young athletes was about 11%. And you fast forward, you know, now where average survival is probably upwards towards 80%. We've made a massive difference in our ability to um, recognize and respond to sudden cardiac arrest in that setting. And, and you think about it, and sports is that unique opportunity. You know, where else, you have all these people watching, and if someone drops, it's, it's a witness arrest. And so we should have both the knowledge and the equipment to respond quickly and make a difference. And when you do respond quickly, when you have an AED on site, you know, survival can be over 80%, which is far different than calling 911 and having that eight, nine, 10 minute delay before EMS can get Certainly. there. Mm -hmm. So bystander CPR and public access to defibrillators is really the key to improving survival. My second talk was today, and although we've made improvement, there's still more to do. And the talk today was more about gaps and how we can improve survival for certain cardiac arrest in athletes. I started the session by asking the audience, you know, tell me what the gaps are. Tell me how we can do this better. And I think one of the messages that was loud was that, you know, th there's no one solution to this, meaning there's no one policy, there's no one educational module, there's, there's no one legislation that's going to solve all of this. It's, it's a lot of people working in the same direction, a lot of boots on the ground to raise awareness, education, um, more staff training, more athlete and young person training, more access to defibrillators, just sort of a, a better culture around sudden cardiac arrest recognition and management, and then, then we'll do better. What were some of the gaps? 
I think that you know the first gap that that was talked about, and then I also um, had thought about was just general emergency action planning, and, and that we can do that better. Like everyone understands the concept of emergency action plan, it is absolutely critical, but we can actually do it better. I mean, we have we have schools still that don't practice and rehearse their emergency action plan. We have coaches that should know about it, but don't. We we have places where sports are occurring and there's an AED there, but the people who are playing the sports and the coaches responsible for those kids don't understand when to use the AED or maybe even where it is. Mm -hmm. And so we can, we can do that better. We need to fine tune it um, and make sure everyone truly reviews, practices and rehearses their emergency action plan before the sports season. Another gap is that there's a lot of focus on schools and not a lot of focus on youth and sort of select sports, okay. which is outside the school system. Mm -hmm. And so when you have schools with athletic trainers, with school nurses, administrators, there's more of a system in place to have good emergency action plans. Now go to select soccer or AAU basketball or right. anything right. like that. And what is, the, what is the structure in the organization that says coaches need to understand what cardiac arrest is, or be trained in CPR, or know where the AEDs are, or mm -hmm, practice mm -hmm. and review anything. There, there is no structure. So, so that space for me is wide open for, for movement and for education and for good policy that we can really make a difference. It is wide open. It's wide open. And is it policy? Is it uh, community-based? Where do you think like the first starting point is to make significant progress? Where do we start? Uh, all of the above is what okay. I'd say. Because I, I, don't, I don't think there's any one answer. So absolutely at the ground level, community base is a great place to start. Mm -hmm. So if you have an idea, go to your club, go to your AAU team, go to your select soccer mm -hmm. team, ask your coaches what's your emergency action plan. Mm -hmm. help, your, help your kids, sports team or club develop an emergency action plan for okay. sudden cardiac mm -hmm. arrest. That'd be a great starting point and that can happen in, in your local community. On the flip side, Let's work with our national, you know, our national organization. So AEU is a national organization. You know, what can we collaborate with yeah. with AEU to take our highest risk demographic, our, our adolescent basketball mm -hmm. players that seem for some reason to have the highest risk of sudden cardiac arrest, and and do more. So can we work with the national organization mm -hmm. to make a difference and sort of come at it from both ways? And maybe the national organization can distribute educational materials, um, training modules, things like that. I, I don't know if they can truly require it or mandate it, but they could certainly help promote it. And that would raise a lot of awareness. Okay. Yeah. And you're the first author for the International Guidelines for ECG Interpretation and in Athletes. Could you share some of the key insights from these guide guidelines and like the significance in the field? Sure, sure. So let's back up a step and just talk about screening. So yes. When we're thinking about our kids playing sports and prevention of, of sudden death, you know, one aspect is the emergency action plans and having AEDs, and the other side is screening. And the, the purpose of screening is early detection of right, heart conditions right. at risk for, for sudden death. Mm -hmm. And we like to think that the usual model for screening, which our kids get, a, you know, a sports physical, what's called a PPE, or right, right. pre participation mm -hmm. physical evaluation, is effective. It's based traditionally on a history, a questionnaire form, and a stethoscope. Mm -hmm. And the reality is it doesn't work very well. And while the concept is good, the data and the evidence just doesn't pan out. Something's it, missing. Absolutely. And the, and the problem is that most kids who go on to have sudden cardiac arrest don't have signs or symptoms that they have a heart problem. And so if we're asking questions, do you have chest pain? You know, have you passed out, which are important for a, a small subset. But if eight out of 10 kids who go on to cardiac arrest don't have any symptoms, then we've already missed the majority yes. of kids at risk okay. if we're, all we're doing is a history and physical. So we need to do something better if we're serious about screening. And at the collegiate level, at the professional level, we are doing something different, right, right. which is using an electrocardiogram or, or an ECG or EKG, however mm -hmm. you want to call it. Um, they're the same thing. <laughs> and so in, wh what is an ECG? An ECG are patches on the skin that, that monitor the electrical signal of the heart from different directions right. and you get a tracing on a piece of paper. And it's called an electrocardiogram. And we can see evidence that might suggest there's a heart problem, either an electrical disturbance of the heart right. that 
put people at risk for cardiac arrest or perhaps a, a heart muscle disease like a cardiomyopathy that can put them at risk mm -hmm. for sudden cardiac mm -hmm. arrest. The problem with, or the challenge with ECG screening in young athletes is that the, the physiologic changes that occur in a heart when you exercise a lot can overlap a little bit with what's going on in some of the disease states. So for instance, you know, your heart gets a little bigger and a little stronger when you exercise a lot, and mm -hmm. that's normal and mm -hmm. physiologic. But some of the heart muscle diseases also get a little bigger oh, for different okay. reasons. And so now we have to be able to look at the ECG and distinguish findings on the ECG that suggest this is truly a problem and abnormal and suggestive of a heart condition right. versus findings that we can feel confident are physiologic and just related to athletic you know, training and exercise. Sure, sure remodeling of the heart. And so what the ECG interpretation criteria did, it started in, in 2013 with what's called the Seattle criteria, and in 2017 the next iteration was called the international criteria. This took our sports cardiology experts from around the world to come to some consensus on what are in those, those two boxes, what, what can we put as, these are what we consider the normal findings on an ECG in an athlete, and these are the findings we need to be concerned about that deserve more investigation. So when you interpret ECGs using that sort of, those athlete specific standards, we can do much better quality in interpretation with better accuracy. Most importantly, lowering the false positive rate. So a false positive ECG is when we call the ECG abnormal, but there's really nothing wrong with the heart. And if that happens, you know, in 1% or 2% of people, that's totally acceptable if you know, one in five, one in six abnormal ECGs might show up and truly have a, a, a heart condition. But if we're calling 10 or 20 percent abnormal and all of those kids have to go on and get more testing, it's a huge cost, it's right, a huge right, burden, right. they might have be delayed in participation, there's harms in that, and that's not acceptable. So, you know, two decades ago, the false positive rate for ECG interpretation athletes was probably 25 percent. I say on average now it's probably like 2 percent and oh, it's been a massive improvement. Yeah. And so the ECG interpretation criteria has allowed ECG to really have a place in our screening protocols. And now it's just about training more providers to be able to look at an ECG accurately so we can okay. get this out beyond professional and college but into the high school and youth setting. And we're not there yet. We're not there yet. Okay. And it's an infrastructure issue in my opinion. Yeah, we don't have enough physicians who are capable of accurate ECG interpretation to do that more broadly. Is it a cost consideration? Because I remember hearing, right, because in our local high schools, why, why aren't we doing the screening and, and costs kept coming in? Yeah. It's prohibited. Yeah, it can be a cost issue. So let's put the cost issue on a couple scales. So, uh, you know, the history and physical already costs, mm -hmm. right? You're already creating a completely separate physician visit right. to have this sports physical yes. and it has been shown to be the least cost effective model is just history and physical so it already costs. When you add ECG it ranges from $25 to $50 let's say to get an ECG okay. so not that much for some people or communities that might be cost mm -hmm. uh, prohibitive if your insurance doesn't cover it. You know what really costs is not the ECG itself what really costs are the secondary tests you have to do if the ECG is abnormal. So if you need to get an echocardiogram or a cardiac MRI, now you're talking about costs that are yes, like $500, yes. a thousand, a couple thousand dollars, and that adds up very quickly. And so you can't have a high number of abnormal ECGs or false positives. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole point right. of lowering the false positive rate. Be now ECG becomes more cost effective. Wonderful, thank you. So one of your presentations, as you mentioned, was about how the NFL saved a life, right? It mm -hmm. talks about Mar Hamlin. How has the aftermath of that incident changed actions just kind of within the sports community around response? It's not bystander CPR, obviously there was an emergency action plan in place and, and mm -hmm. there was a positive outcome, but can you talk a little bit about how that incident has shifted the what's what's happening right now around awareness? Yeah, you know, the Demar Hamlin incident I think brought sudden cardiac arrest you know, into the dinner table conversation, right? Yes, uh, suddenly yes. everyone was sort of aware, what's this and how can this happen? Mm -hmm. And it, it got on everyone's mind. 
And, you know, first and foremost, Tamar had an incredible save and resuscitation. So glad he's doing well. Right. But what's happened in the aftermath has also been beautiful, meaning, you know, it was on every major, you know, uh, TV station and radio, and everyone's covering cardiac arrest and athletes and what can we do about this. And suddenly, emergency action plans and the value of AEDs and the value of understanding CPR yeah. is, is at the forefront. And so, I think a lot has changed in the last year because of that incident. You know, fast forward seven months and Bronny James has a, mm -hmm. a cardiac mm -hmm. arrest. And again, it's it's just, it's in all the newspapers, at least for a short period of time. So um, these elite athletes who are having cardiac arrest is an opportunity to raise great awareness for the general public. And I do think that trickles down to the youth level. And mm -hmm. so in the sports medicine community, I think everyone wants to sort of tidy up their emergency action plan. You know, following DeMar's case, a lot of discussion on what should be happening on the football field. You know, how do you properly conduct a resuscitation when someone's wearing shoulder pads and a helmet it makes it more difficult? What, what if you're, you think it's head and neck trauma? I mean, there's a lot of questions that can raise issues, but more and more, you know, we try to simplify the response and the recognition. And so what I try to educate and promote is that if you have someone, an athlete, who's been exercising and they collapse and they are unresponsive, unresponsive to a shoulder tap, unresponsive to verbal stimuli, I think you have to assume that could be cardiac arrest and you, and you start your emergency action plan. You know, you, you call for help, you call 911, you start chest compressions, you have someone go get the AED mm -hmm. and use the AED as soon as possible. You just reminded me, I saw, you showed it last night and I had seen it before. You've got something on YouTube that's been trending incredibly. <laughs> it was so impactful. Can you share a little bit about, first of all, what it is, and then also like why? Why did you create that? What's on YouTube is a YouTube video, How to Save a Life, and it's recognition uh, of a sudden cardiac arrest in athletes. And there's lots of training videos on, mm -hmm. on sudden cardiac arrest in athletes, and we've done some with, with actors who do a great job, but there, nothing replaces the, the, the real life view of someone who went into sudden cardiac arrest. And so we put together a compilation of real cases, um, some of which are names people know, like mm -hmm. Christian Erickson, Tamar Hamlin's in it, um, Mark Vivian Foe, but there's other uh, youth and athletes who you wouldn't know their names right. that are in it, but they represent what cardiac arrest looks like. And it's so powerful. We try to make it digestible, that if you watch this training video for two minutes, when you finish that video, you should have an idea of what sudden cardiac arrest and athletes look Looks like, like, and hopefully that stays with you. So if you see something like that, it will dawn on you, wow, I remember I saw that video, this could be cardiac arrest, and you know what to do. So powerful, but then you broke down a volleyball scene. Yeah. And that was so powerful, it really resonated with me, and I think, you know, you broke it down like minute by minute. Can you talk a little bit about like why that was such a successful outcome? Yeah, and so this is this is a, a, a volleyball player named Claire who had a, a cardiac arrest at her high school. And what I love about her save and the video is how well the emergency action plan was carried out. Mm -hmm. And it's similar but also contrasts what happened with Damar Hamlin. So DeMar Hamlin, the emergency action plan was carried out super well. Well, you had a team of 20 medical professionals around them. You probably had 20 physicians on the field, right. you know, caring for him. For Claire, there's not a single physician there. There's one medical professional and it's an athletic trainer. And you just have uh, a school administrator and other people who know what to do because they've practiced an emergency action plan. And so the message to me is not that you need a team of physicians or medical professionals to save a life. You, you just need one person who knows what they're doing, one person who can recognize cardiac arrest, one person who can call for help, start chest compressions, and get the AED. And, and Claire's case really demonstrates that. They, you know, within 10 seconds, they've called, you know, not, you know right. someone called 911, someone go get the AED, the AED's by her side, and within 30 seconds, they've started chest compressions within about 50 seconds. They have analyzed the rhythm and provided a shock about two minutes and 20 seconds, and she's revived. And it's just incredible to watch. It absolutely was. And even like the girls going to the locker room, like they're right. not being traumatized. They're not also getting in the way. Yeah. It just was. Yeah, this was how well rehearsed their emergency action plan was that 
part of their emergency action plan is to send the rest of the athletes to the locker room, which occurs, and you watch that happen, yes. and it's just, it's amazing to see. I've never seen anything like it. Well, I'm hoping that all the viewers watching this will now go watch your YouTube video. Let's and, do it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so as a result of the Damar Hamlin incident, Smart Heart Sports Coalition was formed. Um, how does the coalition translate to athletes across all sporting levels? So Smart Heart Coalition was uh, started by the NFL and now has a ton of partners, which is awesome. And I, I, I think the NFL deserves a lot of credit for, for moving this forward. And Damar Hamlin and his foundation and family is sort of leading this. Um, you know, they have uh, three, I think, simple goals, right? It's that, you know, all school coaches are trained in, in CPR, that they all have availability for AEDs, and they all have an emergency action plan and they're working on legislation in all 50 states uh, until this gets done. And that's wonderful, what the coalition's wonderful. about. I think it's great. And somebody watching this and, and they're saying, okay, this is like youth sports, sports in general, I can do something. How can the average layperson get involved and make a difference in their community? Yeah, I, I think the first thing to do would be to go ask your sports teams, your clubs, your school, in your community, what's your emergency action plan? And do you have AEDs? And who's trained in CPR? And, and if they don't have it, you know, help them with it. Say, how can I help you? You know, can I help you develop an emergency action plan? Can we raise money to buy an AED? Can I help you find CPR training for whoever needs it, your coaches or your staff or whatever's part of your organization? And I think everyone can sort of look in their own backyard, Absolutely. especially for what's close to them. So if your kids are playing sports, great place to start. Mm -hmm, Make sure your, mm -hmm. your kid's coach knows CPR, and that your kid's club has an you know, emergency action plan. And does your, the, the, the venues that your kid is playing sports at, is there an AED? And if everyone did that, right. we'd be in pretty good shape across the US. And so I would say within sports cardiology, you know, for the for the young persons joining the field, like we need you, we need your help. There's so much more to do. Well, I can see that your passion has you firing on all cylinders and contributing in, in multiple um, different ways to this uh, sports cardiology industry and in, in just the field of resuscitation CPR. Thank you so much, Dr. Dresner, for your time today and your contributions. We yeah. so value you. Thanks so much for having me.